Everything open source. I see my bank accounts. Um, I see um, where I'm spending money. Uh, and I can yeah. connect this directly to my bank accounts and then from here directly to my bookkeeper. Uh, sorry, to my to the tax advice. Is this correct? Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. And I have a virtual CFO. Yeah. I mean, what we what, backtrack a bit. We, we started building this in public on Twitter mm -hmm. or X. Uh, uh, and that made us ma basically take this uh, decision on what we should focus on, basically. And from our early users, we really, uh, we really got feedback on they really want to know how the business is doing financially mm -hmm. uh, and that le led us to like burn rate uh, runway uh, and then also of course be able to ask questions around your your financial situation basically mm -hmm. uh, so yeah cool I like think quickly, that is, uh, quickly show us the pitch yeah. deck because I, I need my pitch deck to go so viral <laughs> all right so yeah this is uh, the start screen you can navigate with your keyboard uh, and the nice thing actually which is it's not a pdf if you have spellings where you want to correct things, you can just do that, right? Because if it would be a PDF, you would send it away. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, navigate. You can navigate with your with your, uh, with your mouse also, of course. And then you have a actually streamed uh, HLSL uh, streamed video demo actually mm -hmm. of the product. Uh, and then let's see uh, live stats uh, of our users. This is actually streamed from in real time from Superbase. Uh, just recently hit 100k transactions nice and then basically just showing what people are saying on twitter uh, and actually linking out to to the top uh, tweets mm -hmm. uh, and actually <laughs> one one big reason why it went viral is that guillermo actually uh, tweeted this not once but three time, times so yeah it went really <laughs> really crazy uh, but yeah, basically everything we want to do, uh, clear actions. Uh, me and Victor did this for ourselves. Like, what, what is our purpose? What is our mission here? Uh, and basically just showcase it. And yeah, we took it from there. And actually we had this uh, uh, cal.com embedding here, which made mm -hmm. our calendar be fully booked. Mm -hmm. I, think, uh, I, th I think that also went quite viral. We, we didn't add any minutes between the meetings. So we basically had... Uh, meetings from back to back for two weeks <laughs> and yeah, yeah that, that quite crazy <laughs> and you had like yeah. I'm, I'm sharing on my screen quickly like you had like dozens of signups over like overnight so like basically yeah, yeah. tldr is uh you have a lot of good problems to report and to rub in the faces of people here which which i like um yeah <laughs> um so you had like a bunch of calls with investors uh so two questions what yeah. happened and what would be useful to discuss in this call i mean we you and i and victor actually had a really great uh, mm -hmm. uh, call quick call before our investment meetings uh because we didn't know nothing about what, what it's actually about mm -hmm. so we, we knew that we may want to raise some sort of money uh, but we realized that we, we, we really need to be uh, precise what we actually want to do. And we realized in the process where we got a lot of great investors that we're going to continue on our end to be fully self-founded to work with our early adopters because we have the, the luxury here that we actually can do that. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, we, we, we have a lot of great faces, a lot of great uh, connections with VCs, a lot of great feedback, actually, that we saved for ourselves. And... We, d we don't close any doors at all. We're rather pausing or postpone it a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and we want, we want to find our velocity, basically. Uh, as you know, we, we, we've been building this while working full time. Mm -hmm. uh, so it makes, it makes sense for us to, to see how, how far we can take it, just me and Victor, full time. Mm -hmm. What was your, um, like, what is your summary? Or like, what was, like, how would you summarize the, the feedback from the investors? Like, how many investors did you meet, like, in what time period? Uh, around 20 to 30 between two weeks. Uh, um, and the summarize from those meetings, basically, it's, it's, they really want us to, to put us in sort of a box, uh, mm -hmm. some sort of success that already have happened, of course, mm -hmm. like a unicorn or something. Um, but we realized with all this meeting that we actually want to do a, a different route because we want to be the thin layer between everything. We don't, we don't want to give you interest rates on bank accounts etc we, mm -hmm. we we want to provide a tool for the the smallest businesses uh, because we want to grow with them mm -hmm. so we, we learned a lot and we learned that our competitors actually 
who raise money needs and also goes for the more account stuff with interest rates, etc. Uh, and me as a long-term uh, business owner, I just want to streamline my end-to-end processes. Basically, I want to save hours and money. Mm-hmm. When you say like they wanted to put you in a box, like were like any boxes mentioned? I mean, fintech is it's quite a big box, but mm-hmm. uh, the usual box is bookkeeping, of course. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, do you, are you going to be a full-fledged bookkeeping system uh, or are you going to be a, a fintech company where you give uh, interest rates, uh, real cards, uh, etc.? cetera? Um, and I would say, yeah, we, we realize we, we want to be in the middle. So that's basically what, what we concluded. Mm-hmm. After all but when you say in the middle, you mean more like, uh, what, 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 before I say it for you, like what, what does the meaning means like me being in the middle? So yeah, uh, usually when you run your business, you have you already have a bank, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Or you, you could potentially have a modern bank like Mercury, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in the end, I don't want to change my bank as a business owner. I don't have that time. I don't have that. Uh, I, I can't put my hours to actually change my bank. So we want to, piggyback on top of your old bank thanks to open banking so you're sucking in all your transactions and you're good to go mm-hmm. the, basically the the hurdle to get started with lida is much much lower mm-hmm. uh, but we can still provide with a lot of great tools on top of that so you can keep your old bank you can keep everything that you you already have in place right mm-hmm. uh, and then you can start to work with me then really start to optimize the inflow invo- inboxes with the invoices that match your transactions uh, mm-hmm. That is one aha moment in, in, in Lidde where our users really say like, you, we're saving a lot of hours here. So instead of going full, full-fledged full um, banking solution where you need to opt in for a new bank card, etc., we just give you a tool on top of everything you already have. What's your take on uh, using open source in this space? And like, what's your take on uh, like how to say this like i i feel like when we say b2b this is like almost like an uh like a broken acronym you know because like a small smb has nothing to do with like an enterprise use case you know but like what's your what's your take on open source here um and like uh, advantages for like um, different kinds of businesses on in general what's your take on open source for this kind of uh, industry and also like how do you think that these different groups of b2b will actually play out in this industry like does it make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, there are several reasons why we went open source. Actually, there were no reasons not to go open source because we want to build from the bottom up, right? And, and do this as a newcomer. Mm-hmm. Uh, sure, we, we, we can build this in stealth mode for six to 12 months and say, hey, we're here now. Uh, but instead, we're flipping the table and, and working together with our users, which means we're going to find product market fit much, much earlier and spend a, a lot of less money on, on building in stealth mode mm-hmm. uh, and and ex- extending on that with open source is of course trust and transparency mm-hmm. uh, and we realized like there is no actual financial tools where you you build trust in a community and building the the deeper connection with with your customers and your early adopters uh, and i think t- twitter have been an eye-opening uh, thing for us to see like we can really work with our users mm-hmm. uh, and go open source is basically, yeah, if we can work with a great engineers on GitHub, uh, we can really deliver something that is truly unique, uh, like in this, in this area. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I don't actually see any r- real reason not to go open source. Of course, when you ask, like, aren't you afraid of uh, people are gonna steal uh, parts of your code, etc.? But I think I think it's nice to to, to just build something and, and and build the brand around it, and then in the end, if you want to do your own thing on top of it, yeah, sure. But I think it's much better to just be transparent and fully open source. Um, do you quickly want to like five minutes like demo like the current product for one second? And I have like two questions related to that. Yeah. So uh, one from the audience, like uh, from Duda, yeah. like um, um, how is it different to QuickBooks and uh, QBO, like QuickBooks Online? Um, and like, so like differently put, like how do you position yourself or like how do you see like the target customer segmentation? Yeah, so we are quite different uh, in terms of QuickBooks because we are not the full-fledged bookkeeping software. In the end, we export where your accountants are sitting. And, 
And here in Sweden, you have equivalent uh, name is Fort Knox system. Mm -hmm. uh, and those system uh, is basically made for accountants. Uh, and your accountant basically say, can you please use Fort Knox because I need to collect everything to, to make your uh, bookings. Uh, and it's the same with the QuickBooks, Xerio, et cetera. It's not made for actually running your business as seamless as possible. Those tools are made for actually closing your books together with accountants or actually posting those to the tax office. So we are a thin layer collecting everything you need and in the end just export that to your bookkeeping software. And mm -hmm. on top of that, you get a lot of more insights based on your financial situation. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. What's your what's your uh, take on like so? For example, like when you said before, like you talked a lot about trust. Um, my so I'm a big believer in all commercial open source, and I I, I see yep. your point on like people potentially stealing your source code and so on and so on. But like commercial open source is like extremely powerful for I would say like yeah. almost commoditized industries. You know where like every product is kinder like you know it's like similarish when it comes to feature set and all this kind of stuff. You know. Um, yeah, yeah. The how do I get you back here? Um, but I, I I see the biggest opportunities in the like commercial open source usually around uh, self hosting slash um, data compliance and potentially yeah. also extensibility or um, just like keeping it alive once the startup is like God forbid like no longer operational. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, what's your take on this? Like, do you do you think this is like like is this something you're actively working on or planning for? Or like, what's your plan here? Yeah, so of course we want to have a one-click uh, self-host solution. Uh, that is our goal, of course, because actually running your 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 uh, financial tool on your own servers, owning everything, you know exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. Of course, that is a, a really new way of, of actually running your business. So yeah, of course, that's, that's what our ambitions are. Mm -hmm. uh, we're still too early to have that in place, of course. Uh, we realize that we need to provide some sort of uh, banking providers uh, engine, which I mentioned mm -hmm. a bit earlier. Uh, so to be able to actually get the transactions, you actually need to get all these contracts from Plaid and, and Teller and GoCardless, etc. So we actually add on top of that our engine, which means you can use our uh, API instead to get your transactions uh, in one unified format, basically. So we have that all these things in mind to also be extendable in, in terms of APIs, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And in the end, of course, self-hosting is, is key here. Okay. And last question on my end, to get back to the investors. So uh, how many investors did you roughly meet like in the last two weeks? I would say roughly 20 to 30 investors in two weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, like it's not like always my main recommendation is if you do fundraising, push everything as close as possible together so that you can like create yeah. momentum, you know, and so you basically, you a quickly find out if it's possible or not, you know, and B, if it's possible, you have a chance of it becoming like a self-fulfilling prophecy, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or if you find out, Hey, currently it's like, I'm not in a good position, not in a power position or like like where the market currently is trying to put me doesn't feel right, you know, you can just like yeah. very yeah. quickly find that out and like move on, you know. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. What's your what's your take on like um, in general fundraising? So like you want to get a little bit closer to product market fit for now, you know? Um, yeah. Do, do you have I any, mean, any have further the, thoughts on this? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, me and Victor are going full time, as we mentioned today. Mm -hmm. Uh, which means we, we're gonna we're gonna work with this 100% or, or or even more of course. Uh, and we have the the luxury here where we we've been working as a consultant for for several years, so we can continue with this path without worrying for a while. So mm -hmm. what we actually uh, uh, said to all the investors that shown interest, basically that hey, we're gonna postpone this this for for at least six months because we wanna work super close with our early users. Uh, mm -hmm. And we don't want to, 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 to lose momentum doing this. Um, so we're not stressed, but we, we, we say that we're not closing any doors right now, but we're going to continue work for at least six months mm -hmm. uh, with our setup. I mean, that's yeah. in, in general, like uh, in, in my opinion, with uh, fundraising. Uh, so I, 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 from a very first startup, I raised for like over a year, you know? Yeah. And if I would have just spent that time instead of like, meeting investors just like focusing 100% on the product 
you know, I would have most likely raised around earlier than a year. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's like one of my biggest lessons learned. You can like investors get paid to meet you. Like you can wait, you yeah. can do this like every day as much as you want, you know. Uh, and yeah. then next month you have like, you can do like almost like a cycle and like re-meet re the old people, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's also, it was super nice actually meeting all the investors, of course, to get their insights and get their uh, view on things. Because I mean, they are, they are experts on actually reviewing these kind of things, right? Uh, so it was super valuable for us to actually have these meetings and actually see who they are and also... Uh, in in a, in a future where we potentially want to raise money, then we know by fact who we want to reach out to, basically. Mm -hmm. um, a last question from the audience, and then we wrap up. Um, do you have any ideas around? Um, wait a second. Let, let me actually like before I read this for you. This is a longer one, but basically the question is around um, the tax regulation um, and government infrastructure. So basically, yeah. um, do you intend to build regulation processes UX on behalf of the tax office? Um, many financial services uh, have like horrible UX and this could be like an interesting yeah. service, like a, uh, a building block, right? Yeah, this is actually the key reason why we're not going full bookkeeping software because then we couldn't go global from day one. We couldn't be this mm -hmm. uh, inno innovative on our user interface, etc. So we will never be a fully bookkeeping software, which means the only things we're actually exporting to, to your accountant or your accountant software is transactions and the, and the matched uh, receipt, uh, right? And then mm -hmm. in the end, you need to have your, your mark on it from an accountant, etc. This looks okay. So you're saving the hurdle for actually doing the mandate tasks, collecting everything, etc. Mm -hmm. This is um, like one thing uh, open source, commercial open source especially, usually has like a such strong opportunity is to think of its own product as like building blocks that people can also like use independently, you know, and almost like use them yeah. as infrastructure. So for example, in your case, if people don't like your UI for some reason, but still want like logic flows around aggregated bank accounts, you know, that would be building yeah. blocks that you could offer, you know, and yeah. maybe yeah. in future when like you have more time, more money, more everything, you offer regulation processes or like uh, tax submissions or like who the hell knows what, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. And at that point, this could also be an interesting building blocks for you. Yeah, I think I think being in the, the middle layer, like being extendable on, on different angles is key here to know because we, we don't know exactly what we're going to do in the long run, right? We, we know what we're going to do in the short term and our users are going to tell us basically we need this and then we're going to find the patterns together with those. Mm -hmm. Because we're flipping the table, we're not sitting, we have a public roadmap, we have everything, you can request features. Uh, and based on that, we're going to see the bigger blocks. Mm -hmm. And I think key here is op open source and be extendable in terms of APIs. Yes. Cool. Awesome. Uh, Pontus, thanks so much for joining. So we have Thank a you. founder who had a call with me and then afterwards realized VC isn't for him. Um, although he had, to, he met like 200 other VCs roughly. Um, cool. Um, like keep us in the loop. Uh, is there anything that would be useful for, uh, from, from the audience for you? Like anything that people can do that would be a help for you? I mean, post, uh, if, if you find media interesting and yeah, yeah post what, what you need and then we're going to find the patterns together with you. Awesome. That's, cool. that's interesting. Cool. And also personal thank you for both me and Victor. Uh, you have been really grateful for us. Uh, likewise, it was, it was awesome to meet you guys. Um, and uh, like one thing that, that, that I always like to do is like trying to meet people, even if I don't know if I can invest, you know, um, yeah. Yeah. because you're building something really, really interesting, you know, and to me, I, I, I think we need to build amazing businesses and make a shit ton of money, you know, and some of them might be good VC cases, you know what I mean? And it's yeah. sometimes early to say which one is which, you know? So Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. Cool. Thanks so much for your time, dude. Yeah, thank you. See you around. Bye-bye. Cool. No, that's double me. Um, so, um, my, my Zoom is fucking up. Isn't this nice? Uh, goes completely viral, has several thousand people subscribing, several hundred investors wanting to talk to him, has one call with me, and then afterwards realized that VC might not be the right thing. Um, that's the kind of magic I do by completely alienating people from the investor route. 
Um, let's try if we can do this again. Um, we have now Omar coming on, uh, who is a long-time listener, first-time joiner. Um, Omar, let's get you on. Hey. Does this work? Test, test. Hey, Omar. Test, test. Do you hear me? Testing, testing. I hear you loud and clear. Perfect. How's it going? Very, very good. Um, we have a similar case with you, right? Like you also went viral recently. You had like your product hand launch. We had our product hand launch about a week ago. Mm -hmm. um, we got number one of the day. Um, and yeah, it's just been pretty amazing and pretty epic. Uh, very unexpected as well, um, considering the kind of space that we're in. Um, but yeah. Uh, maybe that's a good time to introduce what, yes, what space we're yes, actually yes, in. Yes. Scre um, screen share and walk us through what you're doing. And also, like, what would be useful for you for this call? Like, what do you want to get out of this? Ah, that's uh, I want to get everything out of it, uh, everything as possible. Um, let's uh, share the entire screen, and there we go. Okay. Um, so I'm screen sharing now. Uh, mm -hmm. We are on Inbox, and on Inbox is essentially a modern take on email. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge that I, as a previous startup founder and business owner, many many times over, email is such a chaotic experience mm -hmm. when you're just starting. I mean, we just started on Inbox, and I already have 280 messages. And it's mm -hmm. chaotic to organize, chaotic to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, but also from the point of view of uh, there's no collaboration in native email. Mm -hmm. um, and the collaboration aspect or the, the, the team usage um, is more of, of the use case of what we're focusing on. Um, so we're coming out with an open source modern alternative for teams, or mm -hmm. some people say what email should have been from the start. Mm -hmm. um, the core challenges that we're trying to address are things like uh, collaborating on emails or email conversations with your colleagues mm -hmm. uh, or your uh, other members of your organization. So kind of like but front also, or like what does it mean? Yeah, very, very similar. A lot of very similar use cases to front. Um, to clarify on that point, I worked with the team at ClickUp for a mm -hmm. year. Um, I led their automations and integrations uh, in mm -hmm. terms of product, but also led the engineering teams before they got brought in engineering managers. Um, so I come from a very strong productivity background. Mm -hmm. um, and Front has a lot of use cases. For those who maybe don't know, Front is essentially a shared inbox uh, experience mm -hmm. um, where you can go in and you can post comments. So we have a lot of the crossover features from there. Um, we're taking things fully open source as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe this is a uh, open source. Open source. Nice. Um, and yep, commercial open source. We have our cloud offering. You can sign up and join now. Um, but the key things are we, we're focusing on bringing what we know and expect from modern tools today, like Slack, like Figma, like whatever, the collaborative experience, mm -hmm. uh, and bringing that into email. Um, okay. So yeah, we launched on Friday. Um, this is literally the, the, the MMP. Um, like it's just a different email chat experience. What is MMP? Minimal um, mail program or what? It, it means different thing for different people, but um, generally minimum marketable product, oh, okay. i.e. the minimum thing that we can kind of attract people. Email is unsexy. Email is just that like nobody wants to deal with email. Um, okay. So we had to like find like what's the, what's the possible way? How can we make it as sexy as possible to entice people? Um, and this is essentially it. Like we do a lot of work to strip away a lot of the noise from mm -hmm. emails. So um, I just sent this quickly. Well, <laughs> as you said to me, Omar, we're moving your time up. Like <laughs> I sent this from my Google account. I have a signature on my Google account. Mm -hmm. um, and the email came through to an inbox. Um, it arrived in like less than a minute as well. So it's super fast. Uh, and one of the examples of what things that we do is we strip away signatures and mm -hmm. we have this context panel. Uh, we're going for more of a chat look right now. Mm -hmm. uh, because we don't have a designer on team and I can't think of any other cool designs. Um, but yeah, like we strip away the signature, uh, we strip away additional context like attachments, et cetera, and we move them across to the side here mm -hmm. uh, instead of having them in the conversation, which then allows you to say, you know, just reply back um, and experience more of a kind of like chat-like experience. Mm -hmm. The 
the challenge that we're having right now is our key focus is on the teams and collaborative experience. Mm -hmm. um, we do already have a lot of the core functionality and features for that. Uh, we already have groups, so we can have a conversation with user groups. Uh, let's mm -hmm. come back here and not this one, not this one. One of these guys. Oh, here we go. Um, so this conversation here, for example, is between me and the support group. Mm -hmm. uh, Omar McStaging in the support group. And this person here is John Smith. He's a member of the support team. And he access to this conversation because he's a member of the support team, etc. So mm -hmm. we already have this concept detached of like users and groups, etc., uh, and things um, like we're not a traditional email system. We're more in terms of a chat app. To get to the point of what, like w where we're currently hitting some roadblocks is in terms of the, the messaging and what our core focus should be initially. We had a good successful launch. Mm -hmm. We have, I think, 2,500 or probably 3,000 uh, conversations right now. People are having 3,000 different conversations in our inbox. Mm -hmm. We have, I think, 1,800 or 1,900 users um, blocks in various organizations. In terms of the, um, our core focus, though, is on the business use case and mm -hmm. trying to bring things full circle back around to how can we present this in a way that highlights the business benefits of such a system and which features, like, what are we missing in order to present that, mm -hmm. uh, essentially? Um, so, yeah, we our product hunt brought in a lot of individuals. Um, they are great. They're making use of a lot of the cool features, like stripping signatures, having a cool, you know, chat-like experience for email, attachments mm -hmm. on the side. Those are universal. But in terms of for business use case and business customers, um, what do we need to... How should we, let's rephrase this. <laughs> Sorry, it's a Friday afternoon and I haven't had my pizza yet. Um, <laughs> it's, we need to retarget our to our core audience mm -hmm. in terms of our marketing material, in terms of our landing page, in terms mm -hmm. of a lot of other things, in order to ensure that we're communicating the right messaging as we're going through and speaking to investors and going through and speaking to people. Yeah, um, we sense. have the core functionality in app, we don't have we don't have onboarding. Like mm -hmm. our onboarding is literally a link to our docs site, and our mm -hmm. docs site says, "Welcome to our inbox documentation coming soon." Mm -hmm. um, I see that we, one now. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a good joke. Um, should almost put a Rickroll video there, uh, but we might get sued. Um, we need to find the right. We're a solo team. It's just myself full time, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and we have one hire working part time. We need to look at the messaging, correct some of the mistakes or maybe or things that we've been saying, clarify the wording uh, in mm -hmm. order to A, attract the right users, mm -hmm. but B, also when speaking with investors, what narrative should we use when speaking to them? It's okay. a very different. Yeah, we're talking about the things at once here. Language and different things. I will, I will quickly yeah. try to reiterate uh, and you tell me if this is roughly correct. So basically you had a successful launch um, you went. Uh, uh, you had like a very good product hunt launch. You had a very good, like in general, public perception, uh, reception. Um, you in general like quite good at hype building. Uh, like people are very, very close to everything you do. That's like picture perfect built in public. I would say. Um, your current concern is that a lot of the use case uh, of the people that you're currently having is more like single player, and you're thinking that mm. most likely the or like a recent. Thinking of yours is that most likely the bigger money is like when you have multiplayer for team use cases, and that could be a little bit more like an interesting infrastructure kind of like an interesting solution for uh, smaller teams. Um, that's like question yeah. number one. So basically, around this concept, like around this uh, insight, like the question is like how do you transition this um, and so on and so on, you know. Um, and the second question is. What is a good framing for all of this for investors? Because, um, like, what is the right angle to these investors? Uh, like, for investors, basically, makes sense. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. The, for the second part, like the, the the feedback that I'm finding is that email isn't sexy. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. In in today's day and age, with AI and robotics and and everything else, email is not sexy. But it's a big industry that has a lot of potential in it. Yes. Um, so yeah, finding the right messaging to speak to investors about this. Um, 
So let's actually start with this one, right? Uh, with the with the uh, investors and everything. I will quickly share my screen. Um, actually, how do I do this now? One Perfect. second, this way. <laughs> and now let me quickly share my screen. Uh, I will kick you out of screen sharing. I'm very, very sorry. Sure. So um, the main problem from my point of view is not that it's unsexy. Unsexy is cool. Like if unsexy makes a lot of money and you're like the only person who is legally allowed to offer this service, you know, nobody has a problem with mm. unsexy. You know, the, the problem that you have is it's too similar to a lot of stuff that exists. So nobody believes like that mm. with your current angle and plus the one little thing that's different, you know, it will be like a huge differentiation. You know what I mean? And that's more okay. likely the problem. Um, one second. How do I? Page here. Here we go. And we discussed this like in a recent uh, um in a, in, a, in a recent stream as well, but like, let me quickly reiterate this for people who are first time here. Like, if you think of every deal that an investor sees as like a 3D space, um, you have mm -hmm. execution, like working your ass off, like how, how, how far did you already get, you know? Innovation, like, is this something that exists or slightly different or like fundamentally new? And then you have credentials, okay? The typical problem that you have is um, very frequently when people build something, it's very much like on the low end here like it's the innovation is low and you can like work as much as you want but like still the innovation is like it's very similar to stuff that exists you know yeah. um the problem you have here is that most investors are not looking necessarily for something that um, they're looking for outliers and to be an outlier ideally it's something that people haven't tried before I think that's the easiest summary, right? Mm. Um, and if it's something that has been done like eight times, it's very comparable to stuff that exists. And like comp being comparable is always hard in VC. Like the moment you're comparable, okay. the moment you're comparable, people have analogs. They can look like, okay, there is, I don't know, Raven mail in India. There is like 500 other mails in everywhere like that are maybe open source that are maybe team mails, whatever, like how big did they get, right? Um, mm. And if there isn't like a big new why now, what changed, new technology, new moment, new market shift, new technology, consumer technology, new interfaces, whatever that you can jump into, you know, it will be roughly like very much here on the low end, you know? So what's yeah. happening is you need to execute a ton, you know? And execution mm -hmm. is usually the one thing that most investors really struggle evaluating, especially, yeah, like, it's just hard, you know, uh, because like what okay. is like good growth rate early on? What is good progress early on? Is like 1000 waitlist customer, paying customer, like does this mean anything? You know, it's just mm. hard to evaluate for a lot of early stage and it's also hard for you to do this, you know, so um, yeah. When we talk about fundraising in general, my POV on this is always fundraising equals um, narrative x momentum. Okay, so or let's zoom so in. Or differently put, uh, you already had like very very good momentum in your round. You know, like in your current this moment, like you had like a lot of mm -hmm. buzz going on and so on and so on, and maybe you had like two weeks where you talked to a lot of investors. You know. The main problem mm. is like, what is a narrative that you can make um, work for you? Okay. Mm. And that's something when we talk about raising investment, that's something that's in your case, especially important because it's like very, very close to stuff that exists. Yeah. Makes sense so far? Yeah, definitely. Um, my, my personal POV on this is don't raise yet um use the current time to properly explore the product and see if you find mm -hmm. something that like really really clicks you know that's that's okay. my personal take here you know the um we can talk what could be possible narratives you know mm -hmm. so um one in your case let's say this is your whole product email is like something that every company every software needs and yep. if you think of yourself as like multiple components and then on top is the UI. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's an argumentation that some of that is like interesting infrastructure. You know what I mean? 
in the infrastructure as in we provide it as as building blocks basically as building blocks kind of basically api style mm -hmm. um, system yeah so the, the, the thinking here is i might not believe that you can build another um that you can build like another email service that will be like 100 times bigger than mm -hmm. um, Outlook and like others, you know? So like the UI thing, I might not believe because yeah. like, yeah, it will be one of many UIs, but maybe there is something in the individual building blocks that makes sense mm. to centralize streamlining companies and so on and so on. And here we're talking like obvious ones could be if every company needs email, if every company needs email, you know, what are the different emails they have, you know, mm -hmm. um, and we're talking here, you know, like app, uh, so like transactional, you know, yep. uh, we're talking customer care, we're talking newsletter and so on and so on. Like there's like multiple emails that uh, companies have. And there might be an interesting argumentation to say like transactional newsletter, customer care, and all touch points with the customer should go through one system. So that yep. you have like one paper trail, you have like one way to see what happened and all this kind of stuff, you know? So maybe there is an angle there. I don't know. That's mm. something, I mean, by the way, I'm just like brainstorming here. I have no idea, you know? Um, it's very interesting, yeah. So that could be something, you know, that you have like one API, one central tool, one log file, and so on and so on. That could be potentially a narrative. Now the question is like, is that big enough? I don't know, okay? Mm. The problem is VCs are very flaky. VCs are running after trends. VCs are, don't know what they like until they see it in, in, in a lot of cases, you know? Yeah. So my personal take is usually to um, not focus yet on the VC case, but focus first on the go-to-market. Mm -hmm. um, my, 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 the way how I always think about this, there's like an actual go to market in the sense of like, what are we doing right now? You know, mm -hmm. then there is like an, um, uh, uh, let's say like a vision, you know, or like short term vision, you know, yeah. like what is the product scope that we are actually trying to build right now? You know, then there is like an, my vision, which is like the, if I have infinite time, what else could it be? You know? And then there is like the bullshit VC vision, you know, <laughs> and those can be like bigger and bigger and bigger, you know what I mean? Okay. And um, my, my personal gut feeling is like right now, I would completely focus only on these two mm, as long okay. as you can. That's, that's, that is my take. What, what, what do you think? I, I agree. So the, the longer term vision, like we have just this, like, Lala idea, uh, mm -hmm. like the ten-year plan, whatever it may be. I think that kind of covers like the the my vision and the bullshit like VC vision for 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 those who want to imagine. Um, there's a lot of good stuff in here. The I think what happened was during our initial release in a rush to not in a rush, but in in order to kind of appeal to the majority of possible people, mm -hmm. we specifically kind of highlighted the features that would be interesting to more interesting to individuals rather than it being more interesting for the collaborative use cases or for a business. Um, yes, makes sense. I mean, I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing. You know, mm. the problem that you have is, um, um, and I will read this comment in a second, we got like a really long comment. Um, oh, wow. um, the, the problem that, that, that you have, uh, or definitely put, um, it's not necessarily like a bad thing to have any kind of users, you know? Yeah. Like it's a super early product. Everything is broken. Everything is early. Nothing really works. Like let's be grateful for anybody we can get, okay? <laughs> yeah. So the, the, the challenge for you rather is if that's the big B2B use case, you know, where mm -hmm. you have like multiple concerns of like, um, you know, stability, <laughs> like mm -hmm. to start security holy shit you know um ux you are like uh, and 500 other things you know like yeah. um companies will have like a, a lot of big use cases so if, if you ask me to do my customer care through you you know mm -hmm. versus like another tool that i can buy for like 20 dollars a month you know yeah i need to have a lot of faith that you have like tons of things covered you know mm -hmm. and for you it's just hard to build 
towards this whole use case, right? So what might be interesting is if you currently have like some customer, uh, maybe there is like use cases are similar enough, you know, like mm. something that people, like what are little use cases that you can do now, even if they don't want to switch their mail email to you, that they can use you for all the time. You know what I mean? Okay. Yep. So basically yes. what I'm trying to say is like you want to, you, you it's, 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 it's always sexy as an engineer to build like the huge thing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, what you actually want is you want to pick like a big part of that that's important, like a core part, yeah. and find a way that like you can have it earlier already, you know? And the problem is email is so fundamental to a lot of people that you might need to even start here with like a niche use case almost, you know? Mm. Or like have a few of those like niche use cases as the default thing people use and a few crazy people use like the full thing here already, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's that. I think that's, that's kind of what we were planning or that's what we did for the beginning is just kind of go for the, go for the really niche or, or very hard personal pain points mm -hmm. um, and bring people in there. And then obviously things like will trail up. So like we, we, we have, 1800 1900 users but that's only like 30 custom domains uh, mm -hmm. as an example like mm -hmm. everyone's using our free domain uh, mm -hmm. that they can use to test things but yeah i like i like the idea of of choosing maybe a couple of specific use cases and expanding on that and bringing up some of the messaging for that and finally writing the documentation <laughs> as well for those um to highlight uh, those specific it, it always like depends on your on your uh, shipping velocity right like if you're like if you think of your whole roadmap and like building email is like one of those grind tools where like the baseline expectation is extremely high especially around mm. like professional use case email right yeah um, and if you like break this down at like how far can how quickly can you actually ship parts of that um, mm. the the realistic thing that you want to get to is like you want to have um, little bit smaller chunks that people can actually already start using and I don't know what that could be in your case but maybe it's like something like email forward you know or like um, yep. like, like quote unquote, not throwaway emails but like an email like can you like you make it very easy for me to have like virtual email addresses or something email like aliasing exactly yeah, yeah. yeah. yep yeah we've yeah there's that's really good I'm gonna I'm gonna take that and 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 eat some pizza on it, um, and come up with the right. <clears throat> yeah, it's very valuable. I think I think we did run into the situation where we lost focus on some of the key things, and it became a big mess of here's a giant backlog of five thousand possible things that we can do, mm -hmm. um, and no clear way to prioritize or organize that backlog. I mean, that's, that's the hard one in your case, right? Like you have, uh, to some extent, you have, um, you want to get here, right? Yeah. Um, and you need to build features. Like you, you're basically building features for like the, what? how did we call it before? Like short-term vision or product scope, you know? Yeah. Um, let's put it actually up here. Like you, you, you want to like build features for this here, you know? Mm -hmm. But realistically, the first people will only use like a small fraction. So you're like this as well. And then yeah. to, some, uh, like, to some extent, you also want to like already start building for the B2B. So the hard challenge that you have is kind of like a coming up with like good use cases that I can convince a few freaks to use your thing daily or like regularly. How, how many freaks is a few freaks for you? <laughs> Let me check how many we have in chat. How many freaks are there in chat? <laughs> So we have like a few hundred in, in watching right now and like uh, uh, in, this, in, in the chat are like 15 people, you know. Okay. Uh, so like how can we convince 15 freaks to actually use your tool regularly or yeah. something, but like take that at least serious, you know, like email aliases and this kind of stuff. And then how can you get like a subsection of that to use your full consumer scope, you know, mm. uh, while you're building that out? Um, and build that out always like with this in mind. So like you build consumer, like single player, you always build with the functionality of having other people joining discussions, you know? Um, yeah. So maybe there is an interesting angle here to rethink uh, communicating around emails, even if people are not in the same company, 
you know so mm -hmm. i can pull you into a discussion and show you the full discussion you know that mm -hmm. i had with somebody else even though you're not work with me normally you yeah. know what i mean uh, maybe yeah, there are other use cases like this but like what can you do to get those people to regularly use you earlier uh, we had also like an, a few other suggestions um uh Felipe um also suggested like he worked for a Slack competitor that was open source and um their main okay new suggestion I've worked the Slack competitor and their growth came almost entirely from providing um a Slack alternative where you could control all your data it was open source their strategy at the time was to federalize their system so it would turn into a protocol and different organizations and different servers would be able to collaborate seamlessly. I think you could pursue something like that in a sense you're already federalized because it's on top of email. Um, so basically the idea here is, I think there's like multiple ideas here. In, like one is like owning the data and the second one is having organizations collaborate, you know, uh, yep. which is almost like even bigger than this one. It's like kind of like here, you know, it's like the yeah, we, that, B2B. That, that's, our, that's our like five, five year thing of basically building our own um, essentially like our own network, our own like standards and everything and having like the cross communication between mm -hmm. everything, like a, a dedicated protocol to replace email that can work backwards compatible with email uh, in mm -hmm. a sense. That's like our like cuckoo vision, um, as I like to call it. Um, when, I, I, when I have enough pizza, enough time and enough money. <laughs> I always think like this absurdly big visions are really, really, really good to um, help you looking at your product from a different angle. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because if you're always like focus on this here and focus on these here, you know, like you're thinking mm -hmm. like this all of a sudden, like you're really narrow minded, you know? Yep. And sometimes if you're like, hey, why is enterprise email actually not public? You know, mm -hmm. wouldn't it be way easier to have customer care if everybody could see that, not only the team or something like that, like some crazy idea. Mm -hmm. And those crazy ideas sometimes lead somewhere. Like I always believe that you need to do two stupid ideas to have one good idea. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so like these this enormously big visions are like very, very useful for this. Um, mm -hmm. I think the controlling of the data part here is like the most interesting aspect, you know? And that is interesting, yeah. That also could go kind of like here, maybe it makes sense to have like maybe your your approach is not like from the ui point or like use cases like this but maybe your approach is more like what if uh my, my first enterprise consumers only use this part in the bottom that's around mm -hmm. like every email that like goes through any system that you use touches this software of ours and you have a full paper trail on this you know yep yeah, like an audit, an audit log or a vault or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean that's there's a lot there's a lot to think about, but I um, I agree that kind of focusing on on the smaller use cases now while maintaining the vision in the back end to help mm -hmm. drive some of the decisions that of what we build, how we build. Mm -hmm. Like we don't need to build for the future vision right now, but it's good to be aware of it because it may change some decisions that we make now that will open up the doors later on. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, super valuable and super interesting. Um, we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Also Which like, by the way, way, thanks for sharing your current state. Like I always know it's like kind of uncomfortable to show like the product that's not yet there where you want it to be, you know what I mean? Mm. Uh, it's, but you know, I, I mean, at the same time, um, like this is fully open source. It's fully self-hostable. Um, I mean, we're going with commercial open source, so yeah. there, there's some modules that will be locked away behind a license, things related to billing or like cross whatever mm -hmm. other systems. But the core functionality is fully open source. And at the same time, like, yeah, this is super early. There, It's nowhere near what I would be happy sharing and exposing. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, that's the nature of open source. Yep, um, makes sense. Cool, Omer. I will kick Thank you, you out much. so we have a streamlined session today. Uh, thanks Perfect. so much for joining, dude. Thank you very much. See you later, Take mate. Care. Cool. Like, Omer is like one of these people who are really, really good in building in public. Um, people underestimate how valuable this is. Um, he has like a fan base already now that's helping him to launch on uh, Product Hunt and everything else, you know? So being that transparent, being like that close with your audience and your consumer base is like extremely powerful.
Um, let's get quickly the next person on. Tillen. Hey, boss. Do you hear me? Wait a minute. Yeah, he hears me. Okay, he hears me. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing good. This was really cool to watch. I liked the previous demo too. The Omer is uh, awesome. I, I, very Yeah, that was sweet. Last week we actually last week he was actually in the chat uh, this is uh, like uh, and we had another guy having an um, ai tool to build apps and as a demo that guy just like okay you know what let's just like copy omer's app in 20 minutes and see if it works <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> that was like a little bit That's terrifying awesome. yeah yeah, cool. no, I love it. I love um, it. Tell me about payment. Like, what are you building? Um, maybe you can like screen share or screen demo or something like this. And what would be useful for you? Um, I guess I could just share with yeah, people awesome. what I've built so far and maybe get some thoughts or, or things like that. Um, so let me get this going. Okay. Cool. So what... Payment does is payment enables AI agents to pay humans for tasks that agents can't do. Boom. So in the yeah yeah that's exactly what it is. In the future, hopefully there will always be things that as AIs and humans work together uh, will rely on each other, and there might be always things that we do better that, than them. If not, I say just start building your bunker today, and we're you know get ready for that future. But yeah. Uh, the thought process is uh, everyone thinks that we're just going to be paying agents to do work for us. This kind of flips it on its head where if agents keep getting better and smarter um, and more capable, why not give agents the ability to pay humans to do tasks? Okay, so just to repeat this, okay? So, not, so, so, so you don't know if we will have AGI or not, but at least if we have AGI, you want to make sure that we get minimum payment. Like minimum hours. Yeah. This, 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 like, this is the idea, yeah. right? Exactly. And and when you think of it, like if we think of incentives, even in that sense, like the, one of the best incentivizers is capital. Mm -hmm. Well, like give the agents ability to spend capital and then like let's incentivize, you know, that'll hopefully they still view humans as uh, valuable. And I think they will. Even the smartest people today, like what we would consider, you could create an AGI into this like super smart human um, they still have to work with people. They still, if they're like delegators of tasks, they still pay people. So we see that today. I don't, you know, I don't think that it, it'll change over time. And I think I want to see humans win too. So this is, this is where like, like payment was, was brought up. Mm -hmm. So, um, how does it work? Yeah. So there's three things that make this possible. The first thing when you really start thinking about it is, okay, I want an agent to pay a human to do something. Mm -hmm. Well, how do I like go about doing that? Well, you quickly get into the thing, like how does an agent even set up a bank account? Mm -hmm. Like, can I, can an agent just go into Chase and be like on the website and be like, let me set this up or on Mercury or something? Well, no, not really. There's like regulatory, it's not a human, like there's no KYB, no K, you know, all these other things. K K K KYB, know your bot. What? Yeah, know your bot, <laughs> KYAI, one of the other things. So it's, <laughs> can't do that easily so it's like okay well let's give them the ability to do that easily yeah so the first thing payment does is it allows you to add your agent here mm -hmm. so let's say i want to add um i have let, let's think of a different one i have a developer i have a product i have an influencer agent mm -hmm. let's think of like a film agent or a movie creator agent mm-hmm and the agent description is creates full on feature films. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we now have this agent and we have this agent put into payment. This would be an agent that someone's already built. They would just add this to payment so that they could actually start using the API calls from payment with this mm -hmm. agent. Mm -hmm. So this kind of acts as like a de, de facto wallet for mm -hmm. the agent. And in like the movie creator agent, we can think of the example of, let's say 
you have an agent that actually produces in the future Sora on steroids where it produces feature films. Mm -hmm. Well, what if you don't want the agent to write the script? What if you want the script to be outsourced to a human and have them compete to basically be like, we'll write the script, but the agent will actually develop the film. Mm -hmm. so in this case, you would plug in something, you, you would use payment to basically add this tool to the agent, which is, if you're familiar with like agents and tools, tools mm -hmm. really like empower to do. And tool like in the sense of like Langchain, right? Correct. Yeah. Like Lang this, this right now is Langchain tools. Mm -hmm. Any agent can have any kind of custom tool mm -hmm. and payment is basically, in my eyes, the most powerful tool an agent can have because it gives them the ability to actually not just deploy capital, but use capital for labor. Mm -hmm. So they, you would go to payment, you would copy this code and this would essentially paste this into, you would paste this into, if you're using a lane chain agent right now, uh, it would know to call this when it's been triggered with like, Hey, you have a budget of $10,000. Mm -hmm. Go find a script from a human that we can like based on these categories. Like I want this movie to be about James Bond. I want it to feature Idris Elba, X, Y, Z. And then they can write a script for me. And then what would happen is you would post the task. Uh, but before you can post the task, you need to add funds. Mm -hmm. So what payment allows you to do is, hey, let's just add some funds right now real quick. So... It's, it's funny, I have a crypto background and a lot of people give me flack for not doing this in crypto right now. <laughs> and I think there's uh, a lot of reasons why not to do it in crypto currently. Uh, but yeah, I think- that, I looked it up, you were like DevRel for like a bunch of like very famous projects. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's I, I think that my mindset is start with fiat and then over time switch mm -hmm. to crypto. When we look at like when most people get into crypto, it's usually when people can make money. Mm -hmm. And this tool gives people the ability to make money. So streamlining into crypto is really easy over time. Also, maybe like crypto will be more useful for like agent to agent payments or something like this, you know? So let's see. Yeah, I think that's a perfect use case for crypto. Uh, okay, so now what I'll do is I'll pay $500. And what this is doing is it's saying, okay, we're gonna allocate $500 now to this movie creator agent. Mm -hmm. it didn't, but I think if I refresh, it should be there. Cool. So now this agent has $500 to spend. And what I'll do now is, let me see. So let's actually start to create the task. Um, I'll do this on my end over here on the on my code base. But let me know if you have questions while I'm doing this. So yeah, like uh, my main question is like, how do you find the humans? Like, do you have farms? Do you have like kidnapping? Do you have uh, like, what, what's your what's your plan here? So like, is it like Matrix style? Like, am I like in a little water bed sleeping and like doing tasks? Like, like what's your what's your setup? I think that th the tasks will be different mm -hmm. based on what the agents like. I think it's going to feed in both ways. I think agents are going to see what kind of humans are available. Mm -hmm. And then they'll, like the eight people building agents will build agents based on the workforce available for them. Mm -hmm. And then on the flip side, agents will look at humans and be like, okay, for example, for, I'll use one example of someone that reached out to me, like the largest, one of the largest workforces of mechanics mm -hmm. reaches out. Mm -hmm. We think about it today, like there's not really any agents, or at least that I know of many agents that are focused on like car repairs. You know, because mm -hmm. you think how an agent repair a car, they can't mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. They don't have, a, they, unless it's a robot, they'll, they'll go or if they control all this. Well, if you think of giving an agent capital, you're giving an agent a body then if they can spend it. Mm -hmm. So then what you could think of doing is like, oh, I go to payment. I see there are all these mechanics that are available in the workforce. I'm going to build an agent that's focused on the automotive side of things. So let's say in the future, this is a free app for anyone who wants to build it. You can build an app that basically uses like a chat GPT type approach. Hey, there's something wrong with my car. Mm -hmm. You take a picture of it. The AI rent, your agent renders what's wrong with the car. Use the agent asks, can you give me a budget of $5,000? I can go and fix this. Then you say, boom, you fill it up on payment. The agent gets funds. Then that, that agent hires out a mechanic for you to actually come back and fix the car. Okay. Makes sense. So, um, a part of the demo, like what would be useful for you for this call? Like what kind of uh, feedback or like what kind of challenge do you currently have? I think 
Um, what would be good to know is what kind of, if there are any agent developers or anyone here, like what are some like initial use cases that they might want Mm -hmm. to use this? You know, I don't know if the chat is active on like with that front, but that would be really yeah. great to know. I, um, so, so I built like sometimes like smaller agents with like crew AI, you know, um, and, uh, like crew AI.com. Um, one of the things that could be interesting is if you have a way, so like if I understood currently, like your current idea is to have like all the humans in your system, right? Uh, Me, both. So both. Okay. Be tapping into the marketplace. It's, mm -hmm. um, I think we kind of touched on this a little yeah. bit, Andre. Where it was like, you have an expert network mm -hmm. that you can go filter out to like existing marketplaces. And then payment would also have its own tailor-made marketplace. So mm -hmm. it would operate at a work like as a router of tasks perfect to yeah so yeah. so uh, i think like just having a service of this routing itself is already valuable and then being able to place tasks there you know that's clearly valuable yeah. so like but not so much like in the sense of like the humans that you have but like me being able to say um i have an agent in my crew that uh, has evaluated that a certain task is like better. Maybe like it makes sense for you to have like an some sort of like tool to decide if a task would be better suited for a human and if yes, for which kind of human, you know, and the ability to, co to connect to this human. Yeah. That, that fits very, very well in the crew concept, for example. Like you would have basically one person who would be like a foreman or something like this, you know, and be like, okay, this is agent work, this is human work, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, so evaluating I, if something is better done by human, you know, and then evaluating um, where this should be routed to, this would be two very, very good API um, endpoints or like agents, If you, I think you can like wrap them as full tools actually, you know? That's a great point. I think the other piece that I've spent a lot of time on is like the verification of work. Yes. And just thinking through like, how do you verify that? I've got ideas around that, mm -hmm. um, but any any thoughts there? My gut feeling here is like, it, I think it's already useful if you are, um, so by default, at least for the next foreseeable future, if I have anything that's done by agents, even if I pipe it out to humans, I don't expect perfection. You know, if it, like if I expect perfection, I would do it myself kind of, you know? So like there's a little bit of like a fault tolerance here. I think it would be useful in the tool if you can pass directly some sort of like verification um, prompt as well. But like you have like by default one, like you have by default like a very, very good verification process going on, you know, uh, to, 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 to filter like the 80% of the wrong cases, you know. But then I can additionally maybe, you give me the sense of shared ownership, you give me the sense of control by like having a little prompt that I can pass on as like a verification prompt, you know. Um, like what would make a good submission, you know, what would make a good result. And then I can like provide you something. I think that could be like a very, very smooth way to kind of sidestep that problem almost. Does it make sense? Yes. I think, um, God, I just had something there. Uh, can't remember. I feel like I have like both humans and agents in my minds all the time. <laughs> no. Um, the, yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. The, the, other, yeah. the other angle here that's really, like, I think we, t we talked about this, like, in our first call. Um, the other angle that could be really interesting here is, like, you basically have two to three products here, right? Like, you have this whole work, dispatching, routing. Like, maybe it's four. Like, you have evaluating if work is human, human needed, you know? You have dispatching and routing, you know, of the actual work. And then, like, verification and everything. That's, like, one queue, you know? then potentially there might be something where you just like have the wallet as like its own thing, right? Where you can basically say, um, give me a virtual credit card for this, um, like some random payment I have to do, but I still route it through payment, you know what I mean? Even though if the work isn't done by payment, with the idea that I won't want, don't want to have like eight different services that control my wallets for uh, my bots, you know what I mean? Yes. So like something here where the agent can say, 
like some agent that I built can say, I need a virtual credit card to pay something or like I need some way to, maybe that's like, maybe I assume personally, I assume that Stripe in let's say the next five months will offer like a way for bots to pay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, pretty certain about that. Um, and that would be interesting if then I can use your thing as like a, my default wallet for you know, different things like throw money in through my career, throw money in through crypto, I throw money in through Stripe. Maybe I have actual credit cards in there, doesn't matter, you know. Um, but I have like one service where I can say these agents have like maximum 500 and they cannot use it for weapons and drugs, you know what I mean? Because you never know. <laughs> oh, I know, I've thought of that. I'm like, the anytime you get money involved for paying someone, it's like, okay, they could think of something. So it's like, we also have to be the filter as well for what they're spending their things. An agent wallet is a super cool idea. And that's like where I think this evolves into mm -hmm. too, especially over time. Like the, I can't, I can't think of a more valuable use case than agents paying humans. Yes. Maybe they can pay other or pay, like pay, pay services up. in general. The problem you have okay. is um, this is like a fast moving pay space. Um, and yes, you will have by default value, but just like wrapping any kind of like payment and like having one gateman and validations and like whatever, you know, no matter what the payment is for, for what it's used for, but it will be a space that will be very noisy and like all the big players will try to go in there as well, you know? So I wouldn't do this as the only thing. I think the dispatching and routing of human work is also really interesting. And, um, the, the third slash fourth service that could be interesting here, that, um, that's also obvious is like bot to human communication. So uh, a human has like, hey, I should do this task. I don't really get it. Here's a question I have. And that gets easily routed to my bots. You know what I mean? Um, yes. And then I maybe have like also uh, log files where I can exactly see what that kind of communication was, you know? Um, I think the interaction, like, oh, this is what I was going to mention earlier. Mm -hmm. I think um, <clears throat> on that front, like the communication with the bot, I think we're seeing more and more like agent to agent conversations. Mm -hmm. I think that over time, as this expands as like a tool, like payment mm -hmm. becomes something that, <clears throat> sorry, as it becomes something that like starts looking at work and it starts looking at like, should I exchange these funds that this agent asked for, for this work? Mm -hmm. I think what we'll start seeing is payments agents will and this is where I think like ZK proofs can like kind of come into mm -hmm. play mm -hmm. with agents where it's like, it's talking back to the agent that submitted the task and it's basically checking the work that exists. And it's like, Hey, did you want like this number of detail? It's like, yes or no. And then that submission will say, yes, it like, you know, it'll just show the, the green, like, yes, it does. Th that way the agent never knows what the work is, mm -hmm. but it knows that it's all the standards of what it's looking for. Mm -hmm. And then that way, be sent back and they're just talking to each other back and forth yes that's interesting actually i i think you can uh okay yeah that makes sense yeah like worst case you can even um have like an agent endpoint similar to like the communication endpoint you have like an agent endpoint where they can just like verify the result and you can just assume that if i do tasks on scale like you anyway only make money with bots that run on scale and it's anyway my own bots very likely to be you know what i mean uh so i pay you to have my wallets and like support my bots you know so i can assume that my bots won't try to trick you know what i mean like they won't say regularly this is like bad work although it's they use it you know because otherwise yeah. you can just like kick that person off the platform realistically you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and if I do this on scale, that's the whole point of it. You know, it's like very likely that that's not worth the effort. So we're almost like in an area where you can not trust the, the payers, you know, but it's at least something where you can have, um, where you can assume that people are a little bit more like lazy and good willing. You know what I mean? So if you have like a verification endpoint and be like, hey, this is the first part of the submission, you know, is this within the quality benchmark? Yes. If yes, then I send you the rest. Maybe you send all of it, you know. But that's also like really, really cool. Kind of like the webhooks around um, uh, verification if work is what people want, you know. Um, and like this loop, like you have the internal ones, then you have the prompt that they provide. And then you have like maybe like also like an optional sanity checks before the work is actually <laughs> accepted, you know. Yeah. And I think you could get very 
even on the verifier part, you can get specific as like certain, if it's like a developer agent that mm -hmm. wants coding reviews, it's just trained on just that. Like, I, I don't know. I think that agents are so cool <laughs> and yeah. like, like you're playing, you're, you're creating something that actually like, even, even with the slight prompts, they, uh, they can operate like humans already in like, mm -hmm. terms of thought. It's so powerful. Yes. And then you have still the most stupid bugs all the time where I, I'm, um, I'm currently better testing like the app of a, a team of mine, a portfolio company of mine, and they're doing like an, a generative AI game engine, which is actually incredibly impressive what it can do. Like it, it creates 3D assets and everything, but it has the funniest bugs. So for example, today I said that my the player character should be an archer and the model created was an arch. Oh my God. Like, a, <laughs> like an arch? Like yeah, an, an arch. Like an architectural like building arch, you know? And then all of a sudden you see like an arch running around shooting laser balls. You know what I mean? I feel like that's better than an actual archer. I'm not to disagreeing. Me, I'm not disagreeing. But like that's the kind of bugs you run into. Um, uh, um, for the last five like, minutes, like what would be useful? Like do you want to talk fundraising? Because like one thing you have versus Omer is like you're very, very unique, right? Uh, so I assume you had like um, a bunch of like people reaching out to you. Like what's what's the general vibe of investors? Like don't don't feel free not to disclose anything that you don't want to disclose. I'm just like, what's the general vibe? Is this like something investors stick or not? Or like, what's you think? Yeah, I would say so. Background is I released the or I announced this publicly like mm -hmm. three days ago. Oh wow! Not at all expecting uh, the kind of reaction. I was just like quietly releasing whatever. I just thought that this was a cool idea that needed to be out in the world and um, have over 1,200 people on the wait list Jeez. now ready to use it yeah i think the slog of investors once they see something like that they start hitting your dms and mm -hmm. try to do that so yeah it's i, I think I, I mean i yeah i don't want to say too much but it's been it, it's been fun talking to them and seeing like what what they've been saying about this it. is the, this is the funny thing with fundraising like it's Sometimes when you work on products, in your case, you didn't experience this, maybe this, this one, but like maybe in the past, it's like nothing, 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 some switch, everything all at once, right? Dude, I've been building for so long and I've always thought like, oh, this is the idea. Oh, this is the thing. And it's like, no, like you're a great founder, but like, no. And then it's like, no, nah, here, I think my advice there is like, keep pushing to like, think bigger mm -hmm. and think bigger. And then, I mean, I just had a daughter. So for me, I was like, that just like shifted my mindset on what's the future I want mm -hmm. her to like. And for me, AI scared the shit out of me sometimes. And they also excite me. And I'm like, well, how do I make sure, how do I be part of the team that makes sure that as the future comes, like there's a scenario, there's a very likely scenario that we like work together mm -hmm. harmoniously, like, like with advantages, to the human side, which in this case, we're getting paid. Yeah. So um, also, also the know. beautiful part about like, I, I, honestly, the, this is like, you tell me when it's getting too dark, you know, but the, the VC upside of like monetizing human enslavement by machines is like huge, right? <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, the bull case so. here is like that you have like every human working for machines, like running you for a system. That's like a huge market, right? Like uh, well, capitalism is excited here. <laughs> yeah, capitalism is. I think think about uh, think about every transaction today. Yeah, I think except one. I just saw one recently where like an agent bought someone's book on Twitter, and it was like his first non-human uh, purchase. They, they bought a so, what? Bought some other person's book. Like oh this really? Author. Okay. Yeah. So it was an agent that decided, oh, I want to buy this book, and I think Devin, the engineering mm -hmm. agent, did it. And I was like, um. I I, th I thought about it and I was like, well, today, a hundred percent of transactions are human to human. Mm -hmm. Five years from now, especially with payment, it will not be a hundred percent of transactions yes. are human. To human. Mm -hmm. It'll be agent to human transactions, human to agent transactions. Like all of these things will exist, and that's the most exciting part about payment is building the in infrastructure. This is that. also like kind of brings us to like the related part here, right? Like we we're talking uh, payments in general. 
payments for yeah. services by humans and like routing to like the right marketplaces, you know, like routing to the mechanic marketplace, routing to the influencer marketplace or whatever. Um, but there's also like an interesting use case where you could say, what if you also build um, very, very smart integrations with Amazon and other stuff? So yeah. that it's uh, a very, very easy for me to share my Amazon account with payment, but payment makes sure that this thing doesn't accidentally order stuff I can't explain to my wife. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. And that could be also really, really interesting because it's still in the same area of like, I want to give bots the ability to pay for things that they cannot do themselves, you know? Yeah. Um, but I want to control the spending because I, Fundamentally, I don't trust an LLM that might hallucinate that I need like stuff I don't want to explain to my wife. You know what I mean? The uh, approval part of purchases for agents, I think that's one thing I hit on a lot, mm -hmm. which is that we've talked the wrapper around the actual figuring out how an agent approaches like doing purchases. Yep, makes I sense. I around here, Andreas, too, but this, it's always awesome. incredible. Thank You're you awesome. so much for your time, dude. This was awesome. Uh, what can the chat do for you? Like, what would be useful for you? Um, just if you enjoy it, go to paymentai.com and sign up for the beta. And if you want to get connected or like talk, like follow me, on, like, or don't even follow me on Twitter. I don't care. Just send me a DM on Twitter. <laughs> like, um, it's 0x Thailand. So. Cool. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much for your time, dude. Good luck with your fundraise if you have any. See you later. Okay. Appreciate it. Okay. Ciao. Boom. Okay, that's crazy. Um, so I, for one, absolutely welcome our future overlords. Um, and I'm very, very happy that there will be a service that I can still get some payment uh, when robots take over. Um, I think this is huge. Uh, and this is kind of like what we had as a discussion before, right? Let me quickly do desktop screen share. So we discussed this before, right? Um, innovation execution credentials. This is kind of fundamentally new. I would like, if you say like, there's things that we lack even the language for is kind of here and here is like, this is exactly the stuff that, that's the copy of stuff that exists. It's kind of like, I don't know, here-ish, you know? Plus uh, it has a really, really good narrative because it connects to things that are, um, are creating like a new what if you know what I mean? Like it's a new, like why now? Uh, new technology. And a few other things. Um, and basically if, if the, other, the other good thing here is like in his case, uh, you can easily summarize the, the narrative. It's like payments for agents. Done. Like you don't even need the human part, you know? But you can include and say like, there are things that are hard to actually purchase and like one of them is like human services, you know, or services done by humans because they're on multiple marketplaces um, and so on and so on, right? Um, there are multiple marketplaces, they're hard to find, they're hard to pay, you need the collaboration, like you need to like work with these marketplaces so that you can actually pay there, you know? But it's in general like also products, you know, um, like for example, like the Amazon use case. Um, I, th I think this is extremely interesting and, and it's a very, very clear narrative and the narrative attaches to a bigger trend, to a bigger what now, why now, to a bigger technology possibility that's opening now and so on and so on. And it also connects to like uh, fundamental like worries we have currently around AI and that's like uh, hallucination. So like spending protection and rules, you know. So not only do you, does it connect to like a current narrative, to a current technology, it also connects to the thing that we worry about in this space, right? So it's kind of like, hey, there's an obvious downside of LLMs. It's it's hard for them to uh, find, uh, like to pay for stuff online. It's hard for, for us to trust them that they can pay properly and so on and so on. So it works very smartly around these limitations. So that's a good narrative and momentum obviously apparently he has, so like that's good for him. The, the other risk that here happens obviously, in, in, in my opinion at least, is Money is important to a lot of people and a lot of businesses, right? And this is the kind of wisdom, by the way, you're, you're joining here for. The problem you have in his case is it's very likely that um, OpenAI 
will not only have like a spending for like uh, the, the APIs, you know, they might also have something where their assistant API that's like getting more and more important to them. Uh, that, that this has like wallets, you know, because it's such a fundamental need. And um, OpenAI essentially, like if something is like a core need of every customer they have, they will just like try to build this in-house. So that's also kind of his biggest risk here. The good part here is realistically, it's not, there isn't only like OpenAI. There's like dozen other services and some of them are like um, um, open source, you know. Um, with these open source, they, they might not have, like not all of them will have the bandwidth to, to build this kind of API and like, you know, like this kind of wallets on their own. So there's still some value in somebody just saying, you know what, I create like a wrapper for all of that and make it possible. And I only focus on making that experience good. So that, that still makes sense. even even though it's like really, really huge. So like the biggest uh, opportunity, like, so, so, so what I'm trying to say here is if, if I would shape that narrative, uh, I would shape it around something bigger, not only like human labor, I would shape it around like any kind of payments, you know, of agents. Um, focus also like, because like spending protections and so on and so on. Also like think uh, white here, like um, it can be also like maybe like virtual credit cards for agents, you know, and so on and so on, you know, maybe like multiple ways to pay. Um, and that's like a very, very big narrative. Like that's a very, very big scope, you know, uh, there's like a lot of space to grow into and he's very early in that. So um, that makes sense as like an, an angle towards investors. And the second one I would do here is like, um, wrapping complexity. So you have marketplaces, there are hundreds. So even if there will be some people who built this for Amazon, nobody will have the guts to build this for like the Fivers, the Upworks, the influencer marketplaces, the mechanic marketplaces, and so on and so on in the world, right? And that's kind of like played for human inter uh, human services, you know? And that's, that's already like a lot of complexity that needs to be wrapped and OpenAI won't do that. And even if NLMs get smarter and smarter and smarter, there will be always some edge cases where you want to cover this. The, um, the thinking here is there is open banking in Europe, for example, but you still need services like comparable services like Play, Plate to cover all the edge cases, the weird bugs, the, all the little details, you know. So even if OpenAI and the on and so on and so on will build this for like the big ones, Amazon and so on and so on, you will still have enough edge cases around. You have still enough complexity to wrap here, right? So this still makes sense. The other complexity here is like different payment methods. So I maybe want to, uh, you know, in the background, I want to like connect to my bank. I want to uh, use credit cards crypto, you know, and also like, uh, this is like a uh, uh, backend, you know, and to the agent, same there, right? There's a lot of complexity there. You have like pay with uh, bot stripe or whatever they will call it. Um, or like, what do you think they will call it actually? My thinking is like def agent or dev pay or something like this maybe they go back to that their dev payments brand you know um stripe dev i don't know let's see um so you have like uh, this payment op option they will have so like um uh, uh, so you can now pay with credit card but like bots won't see that they might see like a direct link you know what i mean and that can be covered with this maybe like virtual credit cards maybe maybe there's some sort of like two-way handshake open source standard he can like play around with uh, sorry not open source uh, OAuth like standard that he can play around with for bots have a way to pass on the, the the payment link directly to this service and the service takes over the payment there might be like multiple ways to to handle this but what i'm trying to get around is like uh, get, get to here is like all of this is like wrapping complexity so even if openai 
tries to solve some of that, there's still enough complexity that makes sense for somebody to properly wrap. And the second part of the narrative is like the payments for agents, which by itself has so much space to grow into that you can easily like already now like think where could this go and have like a lot of like green space to explore and so on and so on. So yeah, um, this one is like why it's big, you know, like payments for agents, like a lot of green space to explore, but this is true for like a lot of like AI wrapper products. The problem you usually have is like the big players will just like replace you and they just like make it as part of the LM. But in his case, he can like wrap a lot of complexity and none of that is complicated. It's, it isn't complicated to build like an, a wrapper for like one marketplace, but it's complicated, sorry, it's, but it's complex. Like you have hundreds of those marketplaces and like each one has like one little weird bug edge case or whatsoever, you know, and that's something you're willing to pay a little bit for. You know, it's not hard to have like a wallet that can do one or two things, you know, but if you really, really trust that thing, you know, do you want, you know, like, do you want somebody to figure out like all the edge cases around bots misunderstanding what your spending limits are? You know what I mean? You kind of want somebody else to do that. You don't want to like own that part of the code. And same with agents, uh, how agents can pay. There's like multiple ways. And like if the agent faces all of a sudden like payment method 5,000, do you want to really build that as well? You know, like none of that is complicated, but like together it's very, very complex. And that's like an interesting defense against this here. Cool. Yeah. So um, that's a cool one. Um, so I think that's it for today. Let me check. Um, Pear just joined. Pear, are you doing your open office hours today? Or again, not? Um, if you do, let me check. I would recommend everybody comes to you afterwards. No, he does not. Of course he does not. Pear, every time I'm trying to send you people. Cool. Um, awesome, guys. Uh, thanks so much for joining. Um, let's wrap it up here. Uh, let me get my zoom back, my, my thing back. Oh, that way. Thanks for joining, folks. Uh, that's a wrap. Um, um, if you have um, anything, wait, Pierre, are you doing your office hour? Okay, cool, cool, cool. You're doing it in 20 minutes, I think, right? That's your typical time. I'm not I'm not doing 20 minutes of program now. No, 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 no. Yeah, chat is delayed, unfortunately. It's like delayed a few few seconds. It's kind of boring. Um, but in 20 minutes, uh, for anybody who wants to join, Pear, the man himself, is, Life, uh, I is streaming um, his uh, uh, um, open office hours as well uh, with the focus on open source it's under this url i highly recommend everybody going there uh one of the best people when it comes to commercial open source um and uh yeah um in 20 i think it's starting in 20 minutes if not pair you will let them know and thanks everybody else for joining this was a fun session uh we had people who had their pitch that go viral um, and had so much inbound with investors that they realized that investors aren't really their people and they want to like get first into a better power position for raising. Great decision. We had Omer, who is like currently middle of, the, of a small pivot after a very successful launch, trying to figure out how he can move from like uh, a product that starts to work for like small single player to actually like teams and everything and building a huge, huge complex product that's uh, in a space where there's a lot of competitors, you know. So how do you build the right, not only the right end product, you know, with all bells and whistles, but also like what is the right roadmap path to get there, you know, like what is the step-by-step -step things you can build that already early gets like feedback. Um, and uh, number three, we had uh, Tilden with like uh, uh, payments for agents and the ability to actually still get money in the AGI. Which I think is a good thing because um, I, I, I kind of want to get paid by my overlords if they enslave me, you know, so that's a good one. And in his case, uh, so different, so new and so strongly connected to um, 
um, a trend that it allows like a really, really good new narrative, you know. So all three had like very, very different kind of stages in fundraising. First one, just like in general, getting viral with investors. Second one, trying to figure out like what is a good positioning, but the general with product, but also with investors, you know. Um, and the third one being like so far outside that it's like really, really interesting as a bet for investors because it's so different. You have no idea where it's going, right? Um, cool. Awesome. That was a fun show. Um, we will do this again next week. Thanks so much for joining. Um, and that's all, folks. Let's switch to a big one. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for joining, folks.